Let's get on to the midweek action from across the greatest league in the world. And we'll kick things off with Leeds United, who lost for just the second time this season after being beaten 1-0 away at Millwall. Four 1-0 wins on the bounce now for the Lions, Justin. As we said at the weekend, a very Millwall runner form, this isn't it. But what a result this is once again for Neil Harris's boys. Yeah, it was an incredible, incredible result in it and a, and a performance worthy of it. You know, they didn't, it was a very Millwall game where they, they, they had their backs to the wall. They answered all the questions though. They answered all the questions. And, and despite Leeds probably having the better chances, there wasn't too many. So I think you can credit Millwall for really, really shutting, um, you know, Leeds out. And, you know, this is a very good Leeds side as we've banged the drum about, uh, for a long time now. Um, but, you know, the way Millwall handled them was, was, was brilliant. And, you know, four games in a row, four clean sheets, four one nil wins, a very more run of form, but they're earning those wins. They are absolutely earning those wins. You know, they're not scraping them. They are putting their opposition um or, or making them ask them a lot of questions and, and they've got the answers for them and that's that's the most astonishing thing about this run of form. Yeah, Millwall didn't create a whole lot in this game. That's gotta be said, but <laughs> you would be mad to say Leeds deserved the win because Millwall had a game plan. And they executed it brilliantly. As soon as they went ahead, no bugger was getting through them, were they, Justin? They shut mm-hmm. up shop. They had those barriers down. They the had mill those, wall. They had the mill wall. They had those steel grates <laughs> over the windows. The CCTV turned on. Um, a laser system inside. All that. <laughs> all that. It was locked down at the den, wasn't it? And it's absolutely no surprise that they managed to do that, considering this is their fourth successive clean sheet. Yes, the opposition is quite strong compared to what they faced recently, but they've only conceded an XG of more than one in one of their last 11 games. They are phenomenal at holding teams off, aren't they? Um And you're right, Justin, that Millwall wall of Jake Cooper and Jaffet Tanganga is proving to be an absolute nightmare to break down, isn't it, Justin? And look, they're linking up for goals now as well. Cooper set up Tanganga for the winner in this game. They are just having phenomenal seasons. Yeah, it was a brilliant finish from Tanganga as well, but fresh from Jake Cooper's winner at the weekend as well. They are are the former strikers in this Millwall team. But I think it's your classic centre-half partnership, isn't it, where you've got Jake Cooper who's going to head and win everything. Um, and Tanganga's a very good uh, sweeper, if you like. So it's that classic centre half partnership that um, that is that is thriving. But we all we all know what Jake Cooper can provide at this level. He's a very consistent centre back. Um, but what he lacks is a bit of pace. But you know Neil Harris has paired him with Jaffet Tanganga, who's got that in abundance. So you know Millwall can um, can get away with it if you like, because there's, there's that a little bit of cover. But you know, I think you've got to you've got to give that whole back line a lot of credit. Danny McNamara, Ryan Leonard, uh, Lucas Jensen in the goal. It was it was a disciplined performance as you as you'll ever see. This is a textbook performance when you're playing against much stronger opposition. This is this is the formula. This is what you should do. Um, yeah, it was it was brilliant. And Tankango and Cooper central to that. Yeah, hundred percent. If you want to embody the Millwall way. Justin, you need a strong defence and the partnership of those two is proving to be key for them this season. But you're absolutely right to praise the whole defence as well. Joe Bryan's another one who wasn't available for this game, Um, but he's another one who's uh, had a really steady start to the season. But yeah, Neil Harris has got them brilliantly organised. And as we said at the weekend, he's proving a lot of people wrong and he's done it Mm -hmm. once again here and fair play to him for that. And all are in the top six now (laughs) with this run of form. Potential dark horse this season? I'm um, just just putting the yeah. question out there, Justin. That's a that's a great question. That is a great question. I would have question marks over their um, squad depth, but I think you know what we what we haven't seen in recent years is really good defensive teams. We've had a couple, not even far from Steve Cooper, um, Huddersfield under Carlos Colbrand, Nathan Jones, uh, and Luton Town. They've they they've crept in and got into the playoffs. So. Um, but they've 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 had you know a fair bit of squad depth as well. I don't think we all have that. But you know what what, what all we we'll do is keep putting points on the board. Get to January and let's reassess there. Yeah, I'm a. I would still be um, having question marks myself, including the striker, um, because it's got to be said. Despite this run of form, I've not been very impressed with Macaulay Lang's stuff so far in a Millwall shirt. But. You know, these things can improve as the season goes on. So we shall see. They've got Stoke at the weekend. So um, 
every chance that they do continue this remarkable form. But Leeds United, Justin. Oh, Leeds United. Three wins from seven for them now. By the next time they play um, away, they would have gone two whole months without an away win, which I thought was interesting, Justin. They are still third, we should say, with this just being their second loss of the season. But despite that, they're just not getting going, are they? Mm, yeah, it's, it's a it's a frustrating one because, as you say, when uh, when the top two um, or, or when the top team drops points, Leeds tend to drop points with them. They, you know, it's a solidarity thing. It's quite frustrating, I imagine, for, for Leeds supporters because you know their running form is not it's not awful. But if you, again, if you're trying to if you're trying to be a title winner, you need to be winning these types of games where the opposition doesn't have the same amount of quality as you. It is going to be tough, but that's where you earn your that's where you earn your title, isn't it? These these tough, grindy midweek fixtures down in uh, you know long distance travels, if you like. I know their away record in in London is pretty poor as well, um, but that's that's nothing to say that they they shouldn't have come away with anything from this game. Maybe a draw would have been a fair result. Uh, you know they were they were they were there or thereabouts within that uh, Millwall third, but they just weren't uh, knocking on the door often enough. And they did have a couple of chances. I think Nonto um, seizing a, on a Jake Cooper mistake was was one that popped into my head. But again, it wasn't convincing enough. And it's this is these are the games where you need to be where you need to grab the uh, the bull by the horns, if you like. You know, grab the Millwall, by, uh, grab the lion by the scruff of the mane. What on earth are you talking about? <laughs> I'm just trying. To, I'm just trying to link it to to Millwall. And uh, I mean, if you want, you, you could link it to Leeds by saying, "Grab the red bull by the horns." Yeah, that's yeah. that's not as good as mine. It definitely was, um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, Justin. If Leeds are indeed the team who are going to win the league this season, which of course they remain the heavy favourites to do with the bookies, then there's got to be significant improvements on what we've seen from them so far this season. Uh, I, w- I would say we've had three to four great performances so far, which isn't a great tally from 14 games so far. All the others have either been wins, which they've made pretty hard work of, um, or they've been really labouring games where they failed to win. I I can't remember the last time we saw a title-winning team who didn't fly out of the blocks, Justin, because we had Leicester Mm -hmm. last season. Burnley did, Fulham did. The last one may have actually been Leeds because I remember them losing a few early on in their in their title winning season. But whatever the case, the performances we're seeing right now aren't befitting of a team many are expecting to comfortably finish in the top two this season. They've still got the inconsistency prop in- inconsistency problem, which promotion winning sides shouldn't have. Now Granted, this is only Leeds' second loss of the season, but they haven't won more than two games in a row yet. And you you don't know what Leeds team is going to be turning up to a game. And I find that strange, Justin. Yeah, the Red Bull has not given them their wings yet, has it? Um, It's a a frustrating one. You are absolutely right. Uh, I think, um, you know, without being too critical, because they are, are, uh, what, third... So it's it's not it's not doom and gloom, but you yeah you know, you're absolutely right. You know we're not seeing a team fly out of the blocks here, um, and that's what we we should be seeing because there is this Leeds team is probably one of the again one of the best squads we've seen at this level. I know they have suffered injuries, but still with the attacking quality that they've got, they should be a little bit more convincing than they are in in the final third. So there's so much improvement they need to do. Look, they are third, but if you if you're saying a team needs to improve and they sit third, then then. By all means, there's a there's a lot of positivity there to grow into, um, but the run of form, the performances, they do need to be better. They do need to be better. I'm going to concede that now. I know I've been against that point over recent weeks, but um, you are absolutely right. If a team wants to finish in the top two, this Millwall fixture is a very good example of you've got to roll your sleeves up, grit your teeth, and get on with it. Um, and you've got to win ugly. And I don't think this these teams capable of that yet, which is um, you know quite a mad thing because we're over a quarter of the way through the season. Yeah, yeah, you're 100% right, Justin. I will point out Leeds actually have one more point now than they did at this stage of last season. (laughs) And if it wasn't for the top two, they would have actually won the league in seven of the 19 previous seasons. But if my memory serves me correctly, this time last year, they would play well for three out of four games and then throw in a stinker. Now it's more like they put in three very average performances and then one worldie. Either way, you need a bit more consistency if you are going to be yeah. you know, 
a serious, I say serious top two contender, like a steady, comfortable top two mm. uh, promotion winning team. Um, just in five in ten, five clubs that Alex Pritchard has played for. Uh, Birmingham, Sunderland, Norwich, Brentford, Huddersfield Town. Yes, very good. Very good. Well done, Justin. Just keeping you on your toes early on in this midweek show because it is a bit of an early recording to what we usually yeah. do. Um, I do have a theory that you kind of bottle it a bit more when there's an abundance of options available to you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fair point. It's, yeah. it's the ice cream theory. I've spoken about it before on the show. It, you know, When you get too much, I get overwhelmed. Yeah, Far too of course. Course. Okay, I'll keep that in mind for, for next week. Um, let's move on because there was a huge game on Tuesday night between the two teams who are the favourites to get relegated with the bookies. But it was Plymouth who ran out the 1-0 winners against Portsmouth thanks to a late Michael Oberfemi goal. A huge, huge result at the bottom of the championship, Justin. Yeah, it's massive. And it's it's one of those games where probably you wouldn't have been surprised if it was a draw looking at the balance of the game and the the, the highlights of it as well. Again, you know, within that moment from Plymouth, it, it probably could have well been a draw as well. Um, but a huge result for Plymouth. They needed a win. They needed to correct this slide that they've been on. You know, a slide of poor performances, a slide of poor, uh, poor results. Um, and they did that. Don't get wrong, I don't think they were very convincing against Portsmouth team, but 1-0 <laughs> win. 1-0 win is, is a 1-0 win and they needed it. Clean sheet is well really important. Yeah, I don't think convincing is a, is a very <laughs> good... It is a, it is a perfect summary of uh, Mil, uh, Plymouth's performance here, really. Because um, this was a remarkable result, um, particularly because by far and away the better team in this game was Portsmouth. <laughs> they mm. absolutely dominated this one. If I saw one more low cross flash across the Plymouth goal and not find a single Portsmouth player, I think I was about to Robin Van Persie diving head on my TV just did. It was astonishing <laughs> how often that <laughs> happened in this game. And then one long ball gets pumped up the pitch. The Portsmouth defender falls over and Michael Obafemi scores. Pretty good summary of Portsmouth's look so far this season once it and um, what I've just said makes it sound like Plymouth didn't have any chances but they did have a, a couple in fairness to them Portsmouth were just clearly the better team and didn't make the most of it and mm -hmm. a big result Justin uh, whatever whatever the performance was like it's a big result how significant do you think this could be in Plymouth Argyle's season it's a big win isn't it it's a huge win against a relegation rival um, but I'm not going to get carried away with things um, at the moment it's a huge positive but Plymouth they are a better team at home and they have played the worst team in the division. So you contextualise it like that. You know, a one nil win is is a is a good result. Either way. Um but I think Plymouth had to adapt in this game. They had to. They had to tweak what they were doing. They became more direct in the second half and the goal came from that as well. Um the you know, the the, the first half was somewhat littered with with overplaying at times and I think Rooney had to change things up and, and, and they did that and they looked a little bit more threatening, if you like, a little bit more assured in themselves. Um, so I'm not going to get carried away because there are a lot of, again, you know, things that make me sort of raise my eyebrows at times. And again, this Portsmouth team, if they had maybe a little bit more confidence, not necessarily quality, but confidence, they probably would have come away with a result here. But it wasn't the case and, and Plymouth punished it. Yeah, I think it's significant in a few ways because, as you say, it is obviously against one of their main rivals in the fight to stay up this season. But also because their away form is absolutely honking. So every result at home is massive because they are essentially relying on that currently to stay up, aren't they, if their away form is not going to improve anytime soon. Um, and it's also big because they've won without Ibrahim Sissoko, who in my mind has been by far their best player this season and has now been ruled out until the new year, which just quickly is a huge blow for them, isn't it, Justin? No, massive. He, he carries so much quality in that in that, uh, in that that final third. He's, he's a... He's a He's still a raw player, but I think you need that. It gives him a bit of edge. But I actually think the, the absence of Joe Edwards is probably a bigger one. Uh, Captain Joe Edwards, he's out until the new year. Um, and I think Sky put out a stat out there, win rate halves when he's unavailable. Um, so Sissoko carrying a lot of quality. He is young, so missing a leader on the pitch in Joe Edwards is also a massive, massive blow. Yeah, if the win rate is halved, then that's not great <laughs> when the win rate isn't great already. Um, so yeah, two two big blows for Plymouth, really. Uh, back on the game itself, I find it difficult to take much confidence away from a Plymouth perspective because they were, by and large, second best to the team bottom of the league. But I think it's a result which 
lifts the mood because they've been pretty poor recently. And when you're fighting to stay up, you've got to make the most of these results and really savour them, haven't you, Justin? But considering they are very much a home comforts kind of team, I think this actually provides more concern than encouragement despite the results. So still a lot of work for Wayne Rooney to do. Speaking of which, a quick shout out for the new video on the Second Tier YouTube channel. It's called, Will Wayne Rooney Be a Successful Manager? I encourage all to watch it, Second Tier on YouTube. Um, a terrible result for Portsmouth, Justin, and they of course stay rooted to the bottom of the table. Now six points from safety mm -hmm. after just 14 games of the season. Where's it going wrong for old Pompey? And do you have hope for them that they can turn it around still this season? It, uh, look, it's, it's looking bleak, isn't it? It really is. Nine points, one win. Um, I know they've drawn a fair few in that time, but defensively they are in absolute shambles. They did look better here. They looked better organised. I think Plymouth having to change what they, how they were playing is a, is a very big, I wouldn't say compliment, but you know, a good nod to Portsmouth getting things right in this game. But it is Plymouth. They, they're they not in a good run of form themselves and they've come away with a defeat. Um, but in terms of where it's going wrong for Portsmouth, I do, I do think it's quality. I think they lack it. I think they lack energy and athleticism in the middle of the park, which is making you know games not as competitive as they can be. It was a, a better performance from Portsmouth. I thought they edged the first half. Plymouth did respond well in the second. But ultimately, they were edged out in a tight game by a team that seized their moment. And I don't think Portsmouth are getting that down to confidence but also down to yeah, quality of that team well I've mentioned it a million times before but I think the horrendous fixture schedule at the start of the season has really kneecapped them because it meant they lost all the momentum from last season and that is a big thing in my view but over time it's become quite apparent that their summer transfer window wasn't where it needs to be as you said back in September in fairness to you Justin and um, some of their new signings have done pretty well particularly Josh Murphy and Freddie Potts I think those two definitely deserve a lot of credit but it's clear they didn't strengthen enough in other areas namely up front losing Colby Bishop in the summer was obviously a big blow and none of the lads they've tried up top so far have looked anywhere near good enough and that's a big, big concern. I I still hold out hope for Portsmouth, though, because I don't think they've been as bad as their results suggest. They've shown plenty of life on many occasions. I think the attacking trio of Matt Ritchie, Callum Lang and Josh Murphy is uh, showing quite a bit of promise. But, you know... They uh, they are still bottom of the league and they are also a bit of a mess at the back as well. So, yeah, you, you need to try and take the positives along with the negatives. I mean, you have got to keep in mind they're one of only two teams to get anything at Ellen Road this season, which is uh, <laughs> which is proof that uh, there are still positives and they have got a fight about them. So I have got faith they can turn this around, but they need to see an improvement quickly, don't they, Justin? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, six points is, is pretty significant at this stage in the season. I know it's only a couple of wins and the game's come thick and fast, but you know, where's that next win coming from for Portsmouth? That's the uh, that's the worrying thing. It's it's looking like it's a million miles away at the moment, and um, that can't be the case. This this was close. I will I will add um, that you know they were close to getting something from this, but like I said, Perth are not in a good run of form themselves, and it wasn't a overly convincing performance from Portsmouth. It was better. But it wasn't it wasn't a massive turnaround. So yeah, it's big, big steps need to need to be had for, for Portsmouth. They've got Preston at home at the weekend, which feels like a feels like a big game. Big game for Portsmouth. A manager who's finding himself under increasing pressure is Tim Volta at Hall City. It's after they lost one nil away at Oxford to give them their first win in nine. It means Hull are now without a win in six after this result. A great tweet here from Daniel Storey from the I newspaper at the weekend. Tim Volta criticised Hull supporters. Tonight, losing 1-0 at Oxford, they chanted, Are we loud enough for you? Tim Volta, your football is shit and Volta ball is fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny, yeah, okay. Justin. And it's clear Hull fans are running out of patience with old Timmy Volta, aren't they? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's easy to see why. It is understandable. Oxford are out of form going into this game. Hull didn't really come into it firing. Um, and, and, and I guess the immediacy of the, the frustration in the result of form is, is going to make things boil 
a little bit for Hull fans. I, I still think you need to caveat it with the issue that the club's recruitment policy in the summer was ridiculous. Big turnover. Uh, and Tim Volta was simply dealing uh, with the hangover from that. I think the other thing that confuses me massively is they gave him the job on the 31st of May. They had, the rest of, you know, they, they had an entire summer to plan, but they left things until the final week of the transfer window, which is just ridiculous. So whilst Tim Volta's getting a lot of heat from fans, and yes, to quote Hall fans, his football might be a bit shit, um, he's not getting results. He's going to be under pressure. And unfortunately, if you start picking arguments with supporters or, or picking up negativities with supporters, then you are you are making a rod for your own back. Yeah, when you, when a manager's doing that, it never seems to end well, does it? No. I can't recall too many occasions where it has ended well. I will point out, who were actually clearly the much better team in this game. They created far yeah. more chances than Oxford, but just couldn't put them away. Unfortunately for Tim Volta, though, it's a results game, and it looks like he may very well be on his last life. He... Is an entertaining guy to watch on the sidelines, Justin. We, we we will always say that because it's quite clear that he's a bit mad. But his football, not as entertaining as his touchline antics because we were promised heart attack football when he came in because it was so front-footed. We've seen that a few times, but when we have, it's often been executed terribly. So he's trying to be a bit more diplomatic and that's why Hall fans are now telling him his football is shit. And when you've got the fans chanting that at you, you win this in six. And Justin, and this is probably the most important thing here. You've got that international break next week, which so often has proven to be a burial ground for struggling managers. The third one in the season. I think he's in trouble, Justin. I, it, it, he is. He is. I, I think he, I don't know. There are two ways you can take Akonili Kali coming out and still fully backing and supporting Tim Volta. You can take it in two ways, can't you? Whether that's the dreaded vote of confidence, if you like the football cliche. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> or or he just he's really behind him. Maybe. The sincerity of it, you know, maybe I'm, I'm blind to it. But look, if, if, if the club wants to see the, um, if the, you know, if the, the owner wants to see the club competing higher, then sure, he could go. But who do they bring in? The only manager they got right was Liam Rossini. They sacked him. He's doing a fairly okay at Strasbourg in Ligue 1. I think they're he's ninth. really good, isn't he? Yeah, he's getting a lot of praise. He's getting a lot of praise, which is a huge kick in the teeth, isn't it, for Hull? Because they had a very good coach there. But that being said, I think any manager would struggle in Hull's situation this summer, as I alluded to with the recruitment policy. So I'm not convinced they'll get this one right either. Yeah, who'd have thought sacking a manager who was doing a great job, replacing him with a manager who has no knowledge of the league and changing the vast majority of the squad? Who'd have thought this wouldn't work? It's crazy, really, isn't wow. it? Wow. Um, Hull have got West Brom at home on yeah. Sunday, which is uh, becoming nothing short of must win for Tim Volta. If um, if they don't get the win there, then... No such thing as a must win against West Brom. I say it's time and time again. Worst team to play. Worst team to yeah. play. Tim Volta, you're fucked, mate. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You heard it here first, ladies and gents. By the way, just to add more bad news for Hull, the Ecuadorian midfielder Oscar Zambrano has been suspended by the South American Football Confederation for allegedly breaking doping rules. He's accused of failing a drugs test before moving to England in the summer. He is appealing the decision, but could potentially be banned for up to two years. He is only on loan, and uh, actually, Anila Charlie did admit Hall knew about it when they signed him and admitted <laughs> that it was a big risk getting him in. But uh, not what they needed at all, is it? Um, so, yeah, we'll uh, keep up to date with uh, that one as it happens. <laughs> Quick word on Oxford, Justin. Similar to Plymouth, really, isn't it? They were by no means amazing, but a much needed victory. Could be big in terms of confidence, etc., but still a heck of a lot of room for improvement needed. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But look, it's, it's a win in three points. Like Plymouth, it doesn't matter how they come sometimes. You've just got to take the three points, take a clean sheet as well, and, and, and run with it. They have looked really poor of late, and you saw that in this game. There was a lack of confidence at times as well. But look, for a team of size of Oxford, similar to Plymouth, budget and circumstances, it's, it's about building momentum, picking up points where you can and uh, and chipping away. And they did that. This, you know, winning breeds confidence. It turns, it turns, you know, no confidence into confidence. That's the easiest way you can really describe it. And it doesn't matter how the wins come, this will make things positive, more positive going into the weekend. 
Yeah, and got to be said, they were aside very much low on confidence, weren't they? So they'll take anything that comes their way. A 98th minute winner from Harrison Burroughs saw Sheffield United win 2-1 away at Bristol City. Sheffield United, 1-0 down in the 85th minute, managed to pull one back and then the scenes, Justin. Oh, mm. those scenes for that winner in the 98th minute. That is so late in a game, isn't it? It's, uh, it's just ridiculous. Well, it, yeah, I mean, that's what football's all about. Uh, yeah, it was it was a wonderful, wonderful moment. And again, Harrison Burrow's coming up clutch for uh, for Sheffield United. Yeah, brilliant moment for him. Um, but yeah, one 0 down into, in the 80, 85th minute. And in addition to that, they weren't great either. Sheffield United, they were very poor. That's when the wins feel sweeter, especially when they come late. Yeah, Bristol City were pretty good in this game. Just didn't have those those moments of of, of, of quality needed to to get the the game over the line. Sheffield United did. Just yeah, the, the turnaround is, is is monumental. When you saw that release uh, at the end, it was brilliant. Yeah, it, it was a pretty decent game actually. You had the comeback, a, a red card, plenty mm-hmm. of chances for both teams, and of course a 98th minute winner, which is always a great way to top things off. And it's one of those where the Sheffield United players are going absolutely mad, and the Bristol City players crumble to the floor yeah. in unison. It's, it's, it's great stuff from a neutral perspective, isn't it? And what a moment for Harrison Burrows. Two goals in two for him now, by the way. Not bad for a, a left back, um, but uh, yeah, Sheffield United had to really dig deep here for this one and it was a big test and they passed it with flying colours so three wins on the bounce now for them I don't know about you Justin but I feel like these last two wins in particular are significant for Sheffield United because they had arguably their best performance of the season against Blackburn at the weekend and now in this game against Bristol City they showed such courage to come from behind and win here. I think these are two wins which really showcase their top two credentials. And with the small matter of the Steel City derby coming up at the weekend, this has the potential to be a season-defining week for Sheffield United, I reckon, Justin. What do you think? A confidence-spinning week. It can really, really um, propel you forwards uh, this this type of week because... You know, as you said, they were very convincing against Blackburn. Not the best here against Bristol City, but they rolled the sleeves up, created their teeth and got the and got the result. Use that phrase phrasing earlier because that's what we're asking of Leeds, but Sheffield United are doing it, and that's what is making them a, a more convincing top two contender at the moment. Um and obviously they've got the Steel City Derby this week. It's a it's a brilliant moment for them to to really kick up and uh, and get their season, you know, really, really going, which is bizarre to say because 28 points on the board, technically 30, um, barring the deduction. You know, we've not seen Sheffield United at their consistent best. We've seen it in glimpses. We've seen it in glimpses, in moments. Um, but, you know, I think this is the week that can that can really turn it around. But, you know, it's going to be a hard one against Sheffield Wednesday because it's a derby. But what we've seen from Sheffield United is they've got um, they've got the, the, the minerals. They've got the minerals. I think 98th minute winner uh, showcases that really does. Yeah, yeah. And come the end of the season, we may look back at this week as the one which sets them on their way to promotion, potentially, because we've seen two very impressive um, sides to Sheffield United, which we haven't really seen so far, have we? Um, You mentioned that we've seen glimpses of them so far this season, um, but... In, we saw a whole 90 minutes against Blackburn at the weekend where they ripped apart a team yeah. um, who aren't lost at home all season, it's worth mentioning as well. And then you've seen this other side where they can grind out a win despite the odds being stacked against them. That's They're two very impressive things to see from a, a automatic promotion contender. And I mean, it's already a big week for Sheffield United anyway, not just because of the Steel City derby, uh, which we will talk about in detail um, in the preview show with SBK tomorrow, but also because their takeover is now reportedly set to be complete. The move led by an American businessman is said to be close after reportedly being at risk of falling through not long ago. So big, big news for them because they've needed one for a long time, haven't they? So hopefully that goes through without a hitch. And uh, this could be a significant week for Sheffield United, not just on the pitch, but off the pitch as well. Coventry's return to form didn't last very long because they've become the first home team to lose to Derby County who beat them 2-1 
got to be said, Derby's two goals are two of the jammiest you'll ever see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> particularly, yeah. particularly the second one, which was a Jerry Yates cross, which has deflected over the keeper's head. It was completely and utterly bizarre. And then the other one was just Jerry Yates taking advantage of a poor back pass. But uh, yeah, Derby, Justin, have been abysmal on the road this season, haven't they? So what a turn for the books this is. <laughs> it weren't great here either. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were very fortunate to come away with the win because um, I would say the one big chance they had, uh, they took with the Jerry Yates first goal. But the second one, as you say, it's really hard to describe. Again, I had to watch it four or five times to understand what the fuck happened. How <laughs> how did the board get that elevated um, and then loop it could, over the it goalkeeper? Could have, it's one of those where it literally could have gone anywhere and it's yeah. looped over the keeper's head. It's completely and utterly bizarre. Yeah, it's bizarre, but it is, it is mildly amusing if you're not a Coventry fan. But you are absolutely right. You know, Derby's one away from has been abysmal. Coventry, I think the worst thing they could have done, because despite Derby being very poor away from home, they are a very awkward team to play against. They're very defensively switched on. They are organised and they are one of the better defensive teams in the division. So conceding an early goal, I think the, 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 the Derby first goal came in the 12th minute. Conceding a first, uh, first goal then... It's going to set you back, isn't it? It's going to set you back. And a team that is just getting going in terms of form and confidence, it's going to make things difficult. And we saw that. The Coventry got into some really good areas. Um, but as I say, that early goal gave Derby the, the onus. Um, and then the timing of the second goal just took the wind out of the Coventry sail because they were, Coventry were really building momentum up at that point. So I think the timing of the goal just really, really shafted Coventry. Any goal will be you know, frustrating for any team, but this, the timing of these ones was... was just not ideal for Cov at all. Yeah, I think that's a very fair assessment, Justin. I, to give Derby a bit of credit, they haven't. They, they have had a couple of decent away performances recently. Uh, yeah. The Stoke game at the weekend wasn't great, but they were the last team to stop the Millwall juggernaut, Justin, which is looking <laughs> like a more and more impressive result um, since then. And they were much the better team against Oxford not long ago as well. So, um, I mean, Derby in general are just doing surprisingly well aren't they? You, you would have done very well to find a realistic Derby fan who thought they would be 13th more than a quarter of the way through the season, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's, it's, it, they've been they've been good. I, you know, I, I had a lot I, well, had a lot I wanted to say about them at the weekend, but just let things boil over a little bit. I got a bit carried away with the defeat. It was a poor defeat to Stoke. Um, but I think to give Paul Warren some credit, he has turned them into a defensive, a very good defensive outfit. Going forward, I do think they are absolutely hopeless. And that's the that's the key concern going forwards for Derby's, is can they get better in possession? Can they get better at creating chances not from set pieces? Um, that's the that's the key question you've got to label at, uh, at Derby. But maybe this first away win of the season will get that monkey off the back and they'll get going. All the question marks, but look, they are a good defensive team. I think you can you can give them that. Yeah, they've really kept up the brilliant standards they set themselves in defence from last season, really, haven't they? Just in fewest goals conceded in League One last season. And they've continued to be resilient this season. Aaron Cash and Curtis Nelson have been fantastic. And uh, it's funny, Justin, that you mentioned about them going forwards and how you've got concerns there. I was, I've got to say, I, I was stunned and bemused to see that only four teams have scored more goals than Derby this season. <laughs> which I'm not really sure how that's the case. Yes, set pieces have certainly played a big factor in that because they, they've got a lot from them the most in the league. But from open play, they really don't create very much, no. do they? Um, but yeah, whatever the case, you've got to say fair play to Paul Warren. You, me, virtually the whole of the Derby fan base had big question marks over him despite the promotion from League One last season. And you've got to say, it's gone far better than most expected. Uh, what do you think about this game from a Coventry perspective, Justin? Do you think it was just a bad day at the office? I think it was. Like I alluded to it with the, the timing of the Derby goals. That's the frustrating thing for Coventry. I think if, if that first goal doesn't happen, I know it's such a silly thing to say and it's very blasé, but I do think Coventry probably take the um, take the control of that game away from Derby. You know, you give a, a good defensive team like Derby the, you know, a gift of a 1-0 lead. It's going to be horrible to break them down. And just when Coventry looked like they were going to do it, Derby get a second, a very fortuitous second. So it's just one of those games where you dust yourselves down and go again because Coventry, they were okay. Um, they weren't at their best. But like I said, there's time in the goals. I think just just sucker punch them and that's, that's how the game went. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see how they uh, bounce back at the weekend. Very tricky trip up to Sunderland. 
but it's a mouth-watering one into that one. Luton got just their second win in eight by beating Cardiff 1-0 to ease the pressure on Rob Edwards. Got to say, one of the most obvious handballs you'll ever see, not given in this game. Luton had a free kick. It's headed back across goal. Callum Chambers has slapped it out for a corner. <laughs> Mm-hmm. None of this was his arm in a natural position, bollocks. He's it's like a a table tennis slap. It was it was incredible that it was missed. And perhaps the funniest thing afterwards is Omar Rizzo criticized what he said was one sided refereeing in this game. <laughs> really Unbelievable. Guess one of the biggest decisions going his way. He's he's, he's gone full Hirakawa there, hasn't he? Calm Chambers. <laughs> To a, I mean, to a the Hirakara on at the weekend, I, I will still stand by that. I think it was a pretty difficult one for the referee, but just because yeah, Hirakara's yeah. hand moves so quickly. This was not the case here at all. I have no idea how the referee has not seen this one. Um, and if Luton hadn't won, then I imagine it would have been talked about a lot more. But a much needed result for Robbie Edwards, Justin. Yeah, it's huge. They looked far more convincing overall here, here in this game. They weren't you know, free-flowing, creative, um, and did cause a lot of, or ask a lot of questions from, from pieces again, Alfie Doherty once again, putting in some dangerous balls. I think that's where the um, handball incident came from, actually. Was a Doherty free kick? So, you know, there are positives to take from it, from Newton for sure. Along with the win, the clean sheet is much needed. I know Thomas Kaminsky's not been at his best this season, so I think that's going to breed confidence. And they've shut out a team, a very good Cardiff team, who have been very convincing going forwards in recent weeks under Omar Rita. So, yeah, that's a, that's a key positive. So, yeah, it's, it's, there isn't too much I can take away from a Luton perspective because I've been here before where I think they're going to turn things around and they don't. So, look, it's a it's a huge win. It's a clean sheet. You know, certain players back to their best. Like Doherty, McGuinness at the back was very good as well. But, look, let's see, let's see how the follow-up comes uh, at the weekend. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like we've said a much-needed result for Rob Edwards several <laughs> times already this season, only just a quarter of the way into the season. Because what tends to happen is they get a win and then follow it up with nothing, don't they? Mm-hmm. So it's something they've really, really got to do at some point because you can't just keep winning the odd game whenever Rob Edwards is on the brink of the sack because that doesn't help anyone. Um, I will disagree with you, Justin, because... Were they great here? No, not by any means. I was quite disappointed, actually, with uh, with Cardiff, considering their recent form. I, I thought they'd be right up for this one, but they were well below par, like really, really poor c- compared to uh, the recent standards that they've set themselves. Luton were just not as bad as them. So still a long way to go for them to get back on track, um, or at least on the levels that they should be. For, uh, I'll, I'll give a bit of credit to uh, Jacob Brown. That header was uh, really well taken from him. Yeah. So, yeah, certainly positives to take away. But um, as I say, still a long way to go from a Luton perspective. They've got Middlesbrough at the weekend. And speaking of which, Middlesbrough bounced back after their loss at the weekend by winning 4-1 away at QPR. Bloody hell, Middlesbrough were ruthless here, weren't they, Justin? <laughs> it's one of those games where, you know, it's a cliche. Um, it's it, one of those games where the, 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 the manager, I don't think Michael Carrick did come out and say this, but they'll come out and say, well, it's been coming. Um, but this, you know, really well and truly has. You know, the, 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 they were just so threatening going forwards. And I feel sorry for QPR because they, they I think they felt the wrath of so many weeks of, um, of, of, of inconsistency, inconsistency in front of goal from a Borough perspective that... It all just happened here, but every single player in that final third was switched on and on it and wanted to get at QPR. Um, and that, unfortunately, QPR were just, they were they were staring down the barrel of the gun at that point. It was a tremendous performance from Middlesbrough. Yeah, if, you, if you're looking for something that has been coming, then a, a team getting a battering um, from Middlesbrough has certainly been on its way at some stage. And this was the case here because um, it certainly looks like the missed chances problem is over, doesn't it? Emmanuel Latilath putting the goalkeeper on his backside twice. You don't do that if you're The, the, the low on funniest confidence. thing about that goal was he kicked it at the defender in the goal. Yeah. So it was, it was weird, <laughs> wasn't it? Because he's put it in, but it didn't hit the back of the net. So it, it, it didn't really have the satisfaction to wrap off what was a, what was a really, really... Um, composed bit of play from him and I, I say Middlesbrough were excellent they I think they were um, I don't think QPR were that bad I think actually they, they actually did pretty well here and created a fair few chances but 
you know, maybe the scoreline was a bit harsh from their perspective. But as we say, Middlesbrough, at some point, we're going to have one of those games where everything just clicked for them and they did take all the chances. And this was one of those games. I've got to say, I've got to point him out once again. I was mesmerised by young Ben Doak, who, Justin, I think he's quickly becoming one of my favourite players in the Championship this season. He is just absolutely thrilling. It is, it is astonishing how fearless he is as an 18-year-old. He just constantly runs past defenders like they're not there. You know, experienced defenders. He has them on toast constantly. It's remarkable. It's, I mean, it's very early days, but I, I can't recall being as qu- as quickly impressed with a low knee as I have been with him because he has really hit the ground running especially given his age and the fact that he had only played a handful of games in senior football before joining Middlesbrough um, I know he's very highly rated at Liverpool and Scotland um, and I've quickly seen why that's the case because he looks like a phenomenal talent who's playing a big big role for Borough this season Justin 18 years old fearless he's not been battered by life yet has he that's it <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, he's, he's a proper winger. He's a proper winger. I mean, the 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 first goal, the assist for the first goal, typified it. The you know getting to the byline, putting the cross in the near post, beautiful, beautiful wing play. You know, textbook if you like. Um, you don't really get that very often, so it's good to see. But as you say, he's a, he's a he's a player who just wants to get the ball, get at defenders, and it's and it's brilliant. And sure, there's probably still a lot of improvements he needs to make, but he's making a real difference that Borough final third in, in a in a team that sometimes does overplay it. You've got a player who's here who's, who's incredibly direct um, and that's just what you need and he's, he's delivering and as you say, 18 years old is uh, incredible, incredible. Yeah, if you're a neutral and you haven't seen Middlesbrough this season, I implore you to watch a Middlesbrough game and just keep an eye on Ben Doak because he is looking like a serious, serious talent. Uh, as I was saying just a second ago, just now, I don't think QPR actually played too badly here and the scoreline as I say may have been a bit harsh from their perspective but without a win in 11 also got leads away at the weekend which is uh, not what you need but you know it's getting to the stage where Marty Sifuentes despite only signing a new contract not too long ago by the way might be another manager looking over his shoulder during this merciless international break yeah I'd be sad to say it because I love Sifuentes I think his style of football can um, can prosper, but it's just it's just not working out at the moment. With QPR, I think they they have their worst home record, always home start for um, however many years, even worse than the one Gareth Gareth Ainsworth um, experienced last season. Uh, it just tells you how poor things are going so far this season. Um, I think they are the architects of their own problems within the games. I think some of the goals here could have been avoided. You know, I mentioned the good wing play from Ben Doak for the first goal, but it, you know, the key thing there is. He shouldn't be getting to the byline. I just think they don't, they're lacking that bit of uh, you know, aggression defensively that they had last season, um, and it's and it's quite a surprise to see that drop off. Yeah, you know, because they were top three defensive team when Sifuentes came in, if I remember rightly. The stat that you know we we kept pumping out last season, they were remarkable, and now they are hopeless. I think that's the worrying thing. They also lack goals. They need Michael Fry back in. Uh, back to, to full fitness as well, which is a crazy thing to say because he's not an overly convincing forward, but he just brings an element of chaos that keep on do not have. No. In fairness to them, they have just had three draws in a row against Coventry, Burnley and Sunderland, which if you want yeah. three draws, you, they're pretty good draws to get in, in this division. Um, but this Middlesbrough game just sort of feel like they've made a step backwards, particularly at the back, because um, they did give away quite a few chances to to Middlesbrough um, yeah I, I don't know if Sifu enters because I don't think they have been as bad as their recent form suggests I think they have been um, quite a bit better than that actually but when you have gone 11 games without a win and you find yourself sat second from bottom five points from safety already then uh, questions certainly have to be asked so that's where they are and would it be a surprise if he did go during this international break? I don't think it would, um, which is a real shame considering everything that he accomplished last season. Now, there's actually one more game still to take place in this round of midweek fixtures. West Brom face Burnley tonight. A championship game on a Thursday, Justin. Yeah. What is this? The Europa League? Utter woke nonsense. 
Justin. Yeah. Um, you probably shouldn't joke about that after Tuesday night, really. Just just for full clarity, <laughs> for future reference, whenever we work, joke about something being woke, please know it's always tongue-in-cheek. But anyway, we'll cover that game in tomorrow's <laughs> preview show brought to you by SBK, where we'll also look ahead to the weekend. But I think that's just about time for us here on the Second Tier Midweek Show today. Ladies and gents, we'll be back again, as I say, tomorrow with the preview show brought to you by SBK. So we look forward to seeing you then for that. But this has been the Second Tier Podcast. I've been Ryan Dilks. I've been Justin Peach. And a big thank you for listening. Listening.